Welcome again to Question Cafe. Today we've got a slightly different format from usual where uh, I have three of my colleagues joining me today and really encourage everybody to have your chat box open and you can type out questions as per usual but just so you know we're calling it Question Cafe, but we won't actually be answering questions on the fly. Um, we will, I will keep an eye on the chat, we all will, and we'll try and catch anything you'd like clarified. And if your questions don't fall under the kind of broad questions that we're answering today, we'll take them away for our next session. So, right now I'm really delighted to introduce today's presenters, as I mentioned, three of my colleagues, Janine Williamson and Victoria Wilson, give you a little wave there, are both support and education coordinators. Janine is a support and education coordinator and recreation therapist with 10 years combined experience working in adult day programs, long-term care, senior centers, and Alzheimer's Society of BC. Victoria is a support and education coordinator with over 10 years of experience in the community here in BC and in Ontario. And our third presenter is Kim McKercher, who is a provincial coordinator for program development with a background in gerontology and recreation. Kim has 15 years of combined experience working in long-term care and with the Alzheimer's Society. Welcome to all three of you. Thank you, welcome everybody. Thanks everyone. So today's discussion is an opportunity for us to address some of the questions that we frequent, frequently have received from care partners and from people living with dementia. So we're just gonna launch right in. We receive many questions about communication from clients who share things with us like, my mother has trouble following the thread of conversation and answering open-ended questions. Or, my husband says he is stupid and gets frustrated with what is wrong with his brain. The question really seems to be, how do I support someone who's having difficulty communicating? Kim, I'll start with you. Thanks, Lori. Um, so that's a really great question and a question that we get quite often from family members and friends. So one of the challenges that people living with dementia, dementia often identify to us is difficulty following a conversation, and that's especially when in a social setting. So you may have noticed that your family member or friend might be withdrawing from a social setting or activity that they once used to enjoy. And maybe you're noticing that they're not as engaged in the conversation or they might seem frustrated or uneasy. So when there are multiple people involved or maybe if you're in a location where there's a lot going on in the background, like say a busy restaurant, you may see that the person living with dementia their demeanor changes. So often we can notice that they're uncomfortable in that setting and maybe having difficulty communicating by watching their body language. So there can be a number of reasons why someone is having difficulty with communication. Um, and without support, it can have a detrimental impact on their ability uh, to socialize and participate in their community. So it is something that we, we do want to help families uh, support the person living with dementia. And Victoria, I think you have a few suggestions on how we can do that in a social setting. Yeah, thanks so much, Kim. So I think, um, as you mentioned, we try to uh, engage someone in a social setting by setting the stage, if you will. Um, and of course, there are certain things that are within our control and certain things that are outside of our control. So all we can really do is focus on the things that are within our control. So I think you had mentioned, you know, it's challenging in a busy restaurant um, for an individual living with dementia, and that may have been many people's experience experience and so it may be helpful to look and speak with your host to see maybe you can get a quiet corner or maybe if the music is really loud you can speak with them and see if there's an opportunity to turn down the music but again in social settings 
outside of our home, there's really only so much that we can do. If you're having a, a group or a family meeting in your home, there are a few things that you may want to consider. Again, reducing background noise, maybe not having a TV on if there's a lot of people there. Um, it's always good to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation if at all possible. Uh, we often find that individuals living with dementia can become quite confused or overwhelmed by multiple conversations going on at once. So of course it's not to say that you can't have those conversations going on but it may be helpful to have kind of a, um, a point person if you will so that there's always someone who's there to speak to the individual living with dementia and engage them um, and kind of monitor to make sure that they're comfortable in having that conversation. It may also be helpful to consider, if possible, having another space for an individual living with dementia to go to so that if it does become the communication and the conversation becomes overwhelming, it may be helpful to take them to a quieter location, have that one-on-one -on -one conversation, and then come back to the group. It's also helpful, we find, to have, um, if at all possible, avoid the use of open-ended questions. Um, that may work for some people, but for the majority of people, that won't really work, and it may cause some confusion. And so, if at all possible, we find when asking a question, it may be helpful to give um, a choice between two things, or depending on the progression in that individual, even having a choice of two things may be too challenging. And so using your knowledge of the person and what their likes and interests are, uh, it may be that you have to kind of make that decision or uh, use a closed ended question instead or more of a statement that the individual can agree with to then help with that communication. When communication becomes challenging as well, it's very important, of course, to look for those nonverbal indicators, as I believe, Kim, you had mentioned. So really being able to try and identify what emotion is being expressed and then identifying and communicating based on that emotion can be helpful. So you wanna look at body language, facial expressions and tone of voice, and of course, always offer reassurance as well. Thank you, Victoria. Those are great suggestions. Um, so some other common challenges that we've heard from people living with dementia, as well as from their family members, are that sometimes people have difficulty with word finding, as well as they may experience changes to their reading and writing abilities. So you may notice in a conversation that your friend or family member is struggling to find the right word for a familiar object. They might also start describing an object to you. So for example, um, they may say, do you see that thing with all the buttons? You know, I need it for my shows when they're referring to the TV remote because they can't quite find the term for that object. Um, so you'll start to see them using more descriptive language. So people living with dementia may also stop mid-sentence um, or lose their train of, fo of thought when they're having difficulty finding the right word to say. And you may also see them get frustrated if they're having difficulty remembering a person's name. So I've also had many people living with early symptoms of dementia mention in some of our early stage support groups that they've had to give up reading, which is quite a large loss for many people because they're having difficulty following the plot of the book or they're finding that they're rereading a passage over and over again due to short-term memory loss. So another thing you might notice in a family member or friend living with dementia is say you're at a restaurant and they're always ordering the same thing, or maybe they're saying, I'll have what you're having because we're noticing that they're having difficulty reading the menu. So some individuals may also have difficulty putting words onto paper and that could even be signing their name. So say you're at a bank appointment, you might notice them struggling with that. So Janine, do you have suggestions for what people can do if they're having trouble with word finding um, or the changes to reading and writing abilities? Yeah, thanks, Kim. Uh, thanks actually both to you and Victoria for highlighting some of those challenges and providing some uh, really good strategies. And so I do have a few extra to add. Uh, when a person is struggling to find that word, um, they certainly don't need the extra pressure of feeling rushed. 
So what you want to work towards is creating a calm environment, uh, which is already, we already mentioned, means paying attention to the surroundings uh, and the external distractions and leaving them that time for a response uh, so that we can help the person to be successful. Um, another strategy which a lot of people find helpful is um, to have a discussion and have a conversation with the person uh, privately uh, when they're relaxed and not stressed uh, regarding their preference of how they would like you to assist them uh, when they are in a social setting and they're having problems to find that word. So, um, you know, ask them, do you want me to jump in and step in and help you to find that word? Word, or would you prefer that I just wait and, and you want to find the word for yourself? Uh, you could also ask them, are they comfortable with you offering them visual cues or prompts? Um, and, you know, with the whole uh, mindset that you just wanting them to be um, successful in their communication. Uh, with regards to uh, reading and the changes that we see there, uh, that absolutely can be very frustrating for people, as Kim already mentioned, especially if that's something that was very pleasurable and people enjoyed, as we know a lot of people uh, gain lots of pleasure out of reading. So if someone is uh, finding it more difficult to read or hold their attention on um, longer pieces of writing, which is typical when you're reading, say, a novel, uh, some strategies that people have told us that have worked for them is to try shorter articles uh, or books with a collection of short stories. Uh, poems actually can be another good alternative, although as long as you're a poetry person, um, as well as newspapers and magazines. Uh, a great way to connect um, with a person might be to read a short story or a poem together, actually. And so you take turns to read aloud, the other person sits and listens. Um, and then reading short stories, uh, encouraging reminiscing, may be a great way to, again, connect and create that moment of joy. Um, other practical um, options are making sure that the books are large print. And another very popular one that today with the technology we have is, is, is easily readily available is audiobooks. So those are just some strategies. Fabulous. Thank you very much, you guys. That's great. There's a, was a lot of good, uh, good techniques in there. Thank you. Uh, and moving on from communication, another really big area of challenge for both care partners and people living with dementia is behavior. For today, I'm hoping that you can respond to this particular question from a care partner. How can I best respond to behaviors that trigger me as a care partner? Things like being accused of stealing and accusations, bad language, repetitive speech, confabulation, for example, or outbursts of anger. Janine? Yes, Laurie. Um, repetitive questions absolutely can be very challenging for caregivers. Uh, and this may be more than just repetitive words. Um, for some people living with dementia, this might include repetitive actions uh, where the person has the need to constantly, let's say, be rearranging papers uh, or tapping their hands or pacing. And so along with this, you often find, unfortunately, um, them being very clingy or shadowing their caregiver all the time. And as already acknowledged, that this can be certainly very frustrating. And so what we find, it usually requires, uh, first step is that the caregiver take that step back, take a few deep breaths, um, because what you need to do is to get your stress levels to come down a little bit uh, in order for you to figure out how to manage this behavior. And then it's a little easier as well if you've taken that step back and you've taken a few deep breaths uh, to be reminded that this behavior is most often caused by the person's inability to remember what they have said or done or what you have said. Um, remember, for the person living with dementia, they are asking that question for the first time. 
So some practical uh, strategies could include posting notes around the house uh, in answer to those uh, repetitive questions. So for example, if the person's always asking, uh, when is dinner, when is dinner, you could have notes that say dinner is at 6 p.m. or they keep looking for their slippers. You could say your slippers are in the closet. Um, if reading is becoming challenging, you could use picture cards instead of writing the words. Clocks and calendars are another great way to um, help a person, uh, depending again on their ability. And um, as Victoria mentioned earlier, you want to really pay careful attention to what emotion is being expressed. Um, as usually we're shadowing this behavior is often because the person is feeling a sense of uncertainty, um, confusion or anxiety. And strategies for shadowing uh, that um, we've heard do help is you want to give them a task. So for instance, maybe that means folding the laundry. Um, you can leave a note saying where you are. So the note could just say, I'm in the kitchen or I'm in the garage. Um, you could put a timer on and let them know that when that timer goes off, say for in 15 minutes, that you'll be back. And another great one is uh, to put on their uh, favorite music because that can just cause them to just become more relaxed. Now with confabulation, so I'll touch a little bit on that. First of all, what is confabulation? So this is when a person falls in the gaps in their memory with stories or made up facts. Um, it is unconscious and unintentional, and it's a way our brains work to fill in any missing pieces of the puzzle to help to try to make sense of the world. So strategies here for First of all, usually we are tempted um, to try to correct the person. That's the first thing that we want to do. And so we want to say, try not to do that. Um, again, this is another one of our golden rules here at the Alzheimer's Society, where we want to always go for the connection instead of the correction. Um, so an example of this is, say you're looking at photos, all photos with your mom, and you enjoying some reminiscing time. So right there, that's a wonderful way to make that connection. Uh, and she points to her brother in the photo and says to you with a little giggle, that was my first boyfriend. Now, what are, how are you going to respond to that, right? Is it really necessary to correct her? And so the best strategy to learn when a person is using confabulation is to not give in to that urge to correct their side of the story. And so when we understand that it's not intentional um, and it's not really harming anyone, this should help us to just let it go. And so on that note, before I break into song, I'll go back to you, Kim. Thank you, Janine. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, learning to connect and not correct. It, it's a golden rule, but it can be really difficult and sometimes a hard habit for us to break because we're so used to putting emphasis on getting the facts right. And we want what our person to say to be factually correct. And we have this urge to want to respect their dignity. So I do find it can be a challenging one, but so important. Um, and Lori, you had mentioned in the question about bad language and hurtful comments. Mm -hmm. So this can be a difficult symptom of dementia. It can often cause some embarrassment or hurt feelings, um, especially when this seems to be out of character for the individual. So we know that for many people living with dementia, there are physical changes that are taking place in the brain. So when this damage is happening to the frontal lobes of our brain, we often see a loss in our social filter. So this can result in the person living with dementia um, doing or saying things that maybe they wouldn't have before. Um, <clears throat> in some cases, this can mean maybe an unfavorable personality trait is now exaggerated. And without a filter in place, they may not know when it's appropriate um, due to the time or setting, maybe to tell that favorite dirty joke or to use profanity. So they may be using it in a situation that is causing some embarrassment to the family. Uh, often this can happen in a public setting. Um, sometimes it can be directed at a stranger or maybe somebody who's providing support to your family member. So what can we do? Um, I think first understanding that this behavior is largely out of their control, as you had mentioned, uh, Janine, it's not done with intent. Um, and that's really the first step to understanding. 
know that it, it often is those that are closest to the individual. Unfortunately, that can be the target of some of the hurtful words or language. Um, and it's not because you did anything to deserve it. It's just simply because you're the one who's there. Um, you're the one who needs to assist them. And you might be the one that has to say no sometimes in order to keep them from being at risk. So one thing care partners find helpful is using the society's courtesy cards. And you can find these on our website. Um, maybe Lori could put the link in. But these are cards that you can carry in your purse or wallet. And they say something along the lines of, be patient, my companion has dementia or Alzheimer's disease. So letting people around you know what's going on in a discreet way that won't upset or embarrass the person living with dementia um, can be really helpful just to diffuse the situation. So you may also wanna just look for potential triggers. So is the hurtful language um, or curse words, is it directed at a certain person? Is it happening in a certain place or only during a certain time of day? Sometimes there's little changes that we can make to the physical environment or even the way that we approach and interact with the individual that can make a big difference around that. And then sometimes hurtful comments are directed at family or friends or those that are closest to the person because they're actually experiencing a symptom of dementia called paranoia. And sometimes that can cause them to be suspicious. And Victoria is gonna talk a little bit more about what we can do in those scenarios. Yeah, thanks so much, Kim. So, um, as you said, um, and as the question indicated in something we know that uh, people deal with um, in their dementia journey and their caregiving journey is that oftentimes you may be faced with a uh, an accusation or a suspicion that the uh, individual with dementia has. So sometimes this may be um, that, you know, um, if it's a romantic partnership, you may be having an affair or with stealing. That's something that we often hear that um, if an item goes missing, often the care partner is the one who may be accused of stealing that item or a neighbor or a friend is accused of stealing that item. And unfortunately, with dementia, oftentimes, as many of you may have likely already experienced in your caregiving journey, uh, the individual living with dementia's reality is quite different than our own and unfortunately it often is difficult to get them to, into our reality so what we often say is that we have to kind of step into their reality now this will be difficult because of course if we're being accused of stealing we don't want to just say yes I stole that item because that can cause a whole other can of worms and difficulty that may be experiencing so when we aren't really sure how to respond or how to kind of step into that person's reality when it is an accusation or something hurtful towards us. The, the strategy we typically recommend, as we had mentioned previously, is trying to connect on that emotional level. So trying to identify and validate what they may be experiencing and feeling when they say that they're suspicious or when an item is misplaced or whatever the case may be will hopefully allow you to have that conversation and get into a place where then you might be able to um, look through the house with them if they're willing to do that um, and again you know taking their concern seriously and not often trying not to say oh you may have just misplaced that item because what happens very similarly to confabulation is that often the individual living with dementia it their brain is trying to form logic and reason where there is none so if they Think that they put their glasses down and all of a sudden their glass case is not there and you're the only two in the household the logical conclusion that their brain is tricking them into believing is that if the glasses are were meant to be there and they're not there then they must have been stolen and so sometimes that accusation may land on you as the care partner and the person in the home or sometimes there isn't an exact culprit but just that that item has been stolen. And again, that's their brain trying to reason where they may no, be no reason. And so just trying to identify that emotion, connect with them on that level, look for that item if you are able to and if they're willing. Sometimes having backup items, if you know something um, that kind of goes regularly missing and is easily duplicated, maybe they have a favorite blanket that they need 
to sleep with every night and suddenly the blanket has disappeared, it might be a good idea to maybe buy two or three or however many you think just to make sure that you have that item there to present to them while you can then kind of determine where that item may be found later on. So that's one strategy that you can try to consider. Um, and again, it, we have to have kind of a couple of tricks up our sleeves because what will work one day may not work the next day. Um, and what, um, you know, we may be able to do in that moment um, it may be able to work for a couple of tries and then not work, but then work again. So all we can really do is try um, a couple of different strategies. And if those don't work, then take a step back and take a deep breath for ourselves. Uh, another thing that you may try again is to validate the emotion and then try to distract them with a different activity. So one that you may hear a few of us mention today that we like to use um, is, is suggesting going for a cup of tea. So, you know, before we start the search for the glasses, uh, you know, I can see that this has gotten you quite upset. So why don't we go into the kitchen, make a cup of tea together, and then we'll start our search. And sometimes just being able to go into a different environment and distracting them with a different activity may change their focus of attention and then when you leave the room they may not remember that that item was missing and then it's best just to not readdress it and kind of go with the flow and where they're leading you. Uh, outbursts of anger is um, another thing that we can often deal with and uh, that can be quite shocking for us as care partners especially if we've always known our partner to be congenial or very go with the flow and again it's really important to um, try as much as possible to not take that personally and um, just to kind of see if there might be some reason that triggered that anger. Again, this is not to place the blame on anyone. Sometimes it can just be physiological changes that are happening in the in the brain, but sometimes it may be, was the environment too noisy or overwhelming? Did that person get frustrated at a task that they once were able to do that they're no longer able to do? So they're actually quite angry at themselves and their abilities. And then that comes out later on as an outburst towards you. Um, did we perhaps communicate in a way that was challenging? So starting to look for maybe patterns or alternate reasons of why this outburst of anger may be an expression or a response to something may be able to reduce that incidence of occurring and then will be a little bit easier for you and a little bit easier for the individual living with dementia as well. Great. Carrying on really um, from what you were just talking about, it really then a question that comes up often is, when is telling white lies okay? Yeah, thanks, Lori. So as um, you may have heard in some of the strategies that we were talking to, we talked about validating that emotion and a, a differing of reality. So um, we typically don't like to call it white lies in the dementia realm, we like to call it therapeutic fibbing. And that's because it is a compassionate response. And whereas a white lie may be, you know, told for a benefit or, um, you know, may be not quite the truth, but bending the truth, therapeutic fibbing is something that we can do to um, be able to honor or step inside the reality of that other person. So it's not with an intent to cause harm, it's actually to be compassionate to how they're viewing, interpreting, and perceiving things. And so, um, of course, we know, and this is a question we frequently, frequently get because we say, yeah, use therapeutic fibbing. It's great. You're going to love it. And people have a really, really difficult time with this. And that may be because, you know, as we're growing up, we're told honesty is the best policy. Or maybe you've had a 60-year marriage where, you know, honesty and telling each other the hard truths have always been a very important factor in that relationship. So then having a communication pattern for, you know, any length of time and then being told, 
okay, well, actually, let's change our thought process. And yeah, it's absolutely uh, a, you're able to go along with them, or it's okay to tell that white lie. It's going to have um, take some time to kind of adjust to that change and adjust to that communication strategy. But um, it really is going to be the most compassionate thing for that person and will also be um, hopefully with time and using it, uh, using therapeutic fibbing, it will be a little bit easier each time. And Kim, I know that you have um, some examples of where this may be really helpful. Oh, thank you. Um, so I'll provide an example of when it might be a good idea to use emotional truth or therapeutic fibbing as Victoria um, explained. So one thing that it's not uncommon for us to see a person living with dementia ask for somebody from their childhood or maybe from their earlier life. So often we'll see that people can be somewhere else along what we call their timeline. Um, so they may believe that they themselves are at a younger age. So they may be worried that their mom or dad is looking for them, or they may ask, why aren't they here? So instinctually, we often wanna tell the truth um, when someone asks about a deceased family member. And this may be the best strategy for your family right now. But if you tell them, say that mom has passed away and their reaction is one of shock or deep sadness, it may no longer be the most compassionate way to respond in that moment. So consider for your family member in that moment, they may truly believe that they are 10 years old and that their mom is waiting for them to get home from school. So if you can put your, go back to your 10 year old self, what does that feel like if you're in a foreign environment and you're worried that your mom and dad are looking for you? Um, so if I tell my mom that her mom passed away 23 years ago, if I say, mom, you're 88 years old, your mom would be 120 if she was alive. How is she likely to react? So we're remembering that in that moment, she's essentially in a different reality than we are, in a reality that is true to her, where she is not 88 years old, and mom is certainly not dead. Um, so hearing that can be very, very upsetting to that person in that moment. So watch their body language. They're gonna give you clues to see where they're at and whether or not it's a good idea to use therapeutic fibbing. So always taking your cues from your family member. So if using facts and gently redirecting them is working, then go with that. But when it doesn't work anymore and the truth is upsetting, like in the example that I just provided, you really want to start meeting them where they're at. So essentially now we're joining them along their journey in their reality. So what does that mean? Um, it means let's take a look at what we know about mom. Um, so if they're asking for mom, they truly believe in, in that moment that mom is alive. We look at their personal history. So we might know mom was really involved in the church. So a, a response might be, you know, mom's out helping the church ladies prepare some meals. She asked me to stay with you for a little bit. Don't worry, she's okay. She'll be back soon. And once you've reassured them, you've given them a plausible response as to where mom is, you've reassured them that they're okay in that moment, then we can utilize a strategy like distraction or, or redirection. And, and often how I like to suggest that is framing it, asking them if they can do something for you. So you might say, I'd really love to get some fresh air. I've been inside all day. I'd love your company. Please join me for a walk. Um, and try something like that. Or, or the good cup of tea is a good one too. I haven't sat down, I've been on my feet. Please sit down for a moment, enjoy a cup of tea with me. Um, I'd love to chat with you and those types of strategies. But we're always first um, giving them a response, thinking about where they are emotionally, validating that, um, reassuring that they're okay and then using distraction. And I think Janine has another example for us too. Yeah, thanks, Kim. Um, so you'll find as the dementia progresses and there are more changes, um, you're going to see a lot of scenarios where this strategy of therapeutic fibbing or stepping into their reality may become a daily strategy you need to use uh, in order to provide the most compassionate response. So an example of this is when the person living with dementia asks to go home when they are already home. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. So Asking to go home may not be about a physical place, 
but instead it's more of an expression of a need. So what you need to think about is what home might represent for that person. And so how can you help that person to feel home? Um, so again, remembering that home is so much more than just a building. Uh, it's a place where we feel safe and secure. Uh, we feel loved, we feel comfort. And again, this is what we want to, first of all, avoid saying. Um, we don't want to say, but you are home. Uh, this is your home. Again, um, as Kim um, suggested earlier, and I think Victoria as well, you want to think about how you would feel if you truly believe that you were not home, but someone keeps responding and telling you that, yes, that you are home. I know for myself, that certainly would not reduce uh, any anxiety that I had or give me peace of mind. So what you want to do is validate uh, their emotional response and offer them reassurance um, that they are safe and then redirect if possible. So you could say something like, yes, there is nothing like home, dad. But you know what? I'm sure glad we are here together today. Hey, would you like to have a piece of that pumpkin pie I just baked this morning? And you could also ask them to tell you a little bit about home. Uh, Yara, this is another great opportunity to connect through reminiscing. Um, and if this is not working, and, and as we know, and as we've said, not all of these strategies work, and sometimes they work one day and they don't work the next day. Uh, another um, strategy you can use is to give them a reason to stay just a little bit longer. So you could say, um, yeah, you know, you want to validate those feelings you're missing home, but you know what? Could you just wait a little longer? I've just put the kettle on. Or, um, hey, our favorite TV shows come on. Can you watch that with me? Uh, or you could say, I, oh, I have so much laundry to do and all this folding. Could you please help me? I really need your help. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Just trying to include, to respond to a couple of things in the chat box. So thank you. Um, and actually, uh, while I finish up what's in the chat box, I'm going to toss over a next question that while not quite from the chat box, does actually flow from some of the conversation. So this comes to how can I respond when I'm not sure whether the action or the communication is a result of the dementia or from the person's pre-existing personality? Yeah, great question, Laurie. Um, and, you know, despite some of the other challenges we've already discussed, this one I find can often be one of the most challenging for caregivers to navigate. Actually, recently I had a caregiver share with me just how frustrating it is when dealing on a day to day, 24 hour basis with her husband's challenging ways. Um, and in the midst of her sharing, we did actually enjoy a laugh together uh, when she all of a sudden she blurted out to me and she said, if it's the dementia, I want to be patient, Janine. But if it's him just being him, honestly, I just want to give him a kick. Um, and so I actually responded and said to her that she had just used one of the best coping strategies, which is humor. Uh, but Victoria, what other strategies can we try? Thanks, Janine. And yeah, um, you know, as evidenced by uh, the the person who wanted to give a swift kick to someone or and by I think the enthusiasm that uh, we get this question so frequently, um, there is no, as with everything in dementia, easy solution or one right way forward. But as much as possible, it's important to try to not tease out if this is something that's pre-existing or dementia dementia for you to be able to cope and move forward and for that person to be able to move forward often we suggest that if at all possible it's easier just to 
try to not take it personally and frame it as the dementia. Um, unfortunately, because of the physiological changes that are happening in the brain, we can't ever know if that is a dementia symptom, is that a pre-existing kind of personality, is that something that was pre-existing that has now been exacerbated by the dementia, we don't know. And so for your sanity and their safety, it's probably best just to chalk it up to the dementia. And so sometimes what we hear from care partners that has been effective is actually to personify the dementia. So you may have a little mantra for yourself, like that's not my mom, that's Albert you know, instead of Alzheimer's disease, that's Albert speaking, that's not my mom speaking. And so trying to have that, um, that onus put on to the dementia and the dementia symptoms and not the person will hopefully be able to um, reconcile some of those feelings and emotions that are stirred up. And we also know, of course, that this could be really challenging because often our emotional brain and our logical brain can be kind of at war with one another. So we may know, we may try to chalk it up to the dementia, but, uh, and logically know that that may be the case, but emotionally those words can still really hurt, right? And so being able, again, to have that understanding of what's going on in the brain, what those changes can be, and what that may look like in, a, um, in what is being presented to you can also maybe help to kind of personify the dementia. And so, for example, we have a, a Understanding Dementia webinar that talks about the different areas of the brain and what that will look like in symptoms. And so so that may be helpful for our understanding to then be able to kind of take away the um, the reason why that we think that that personality that may have been there is now being seen through um, dementia. And of course, we know how challenging this is as all of the things we're discussing here today as well. So if you're feeling that you're starting to um, really have difficulty with some of either that, you know, is that their pre existing personality or is this de the dementia or how am I going to deal with what's being, you know, said to me or whatever the case may be, then it's a really good time to consider reaching out, you know, if it's possible, maybe bringing in some additional support, considering respite for yourself. And of course, you know, acknowledging that your needs and um, boundaries need to be uh, met and expressed as well. And I think, Kim, that you have some further thoughts on this. Yeah, and it's really not an easy one. And I find a lot of families do struggle with knowing the difference. Um, and like you said, Victoria, sometimes we can't decipher. Uh, but I think the only thing I would add is that it can often be complicated even more when there's underlying family dynamics at play or say the relationship with the person with dementia may have been quite complex before dementia even came into the picture. So as I think many of us can contest, most families, we've had some challenges, right? Um, there can be strained relationships. And so it, it can always add more complexity when we put dementia on top of that. So I think um, part of what we can do is recognize any emotions um, that get stirred up for us and what our triggers might be. Um, especially when emotions are getting stirred up from things that have been quite hurtful in the past. So even though it may be due to dementia because of that loss of the filter, they might be saying things that are hurtful things they may have said before, um, but now they may be more saying it more often or in a time where they're not being able to empathize to see how much it's impacting you. So it, it can be quite hard. Um, Put boundaries in place if you can. So if you're finding that it's really difficult for you to say provide emotional um, or personal support, maybe you can help manage the finances. Maybe you can do some of the yard work. Maybe you can deliver groceries for that individual, um, but you can't be there to provide that personal one-to-one -one care. There's a lot of different ways that we can provide support and if at all possible, consider what tasks can be taken on maybe by another family member um, when can we hire private support? And then look at what the health authority can help with as well. Uh, but if you do find that it's taking a toll on your well-being, um, your physical or emotional health, really do, like 
Victoria said, consider respite, take a break and try to pri prioritize self care. And I know that's easier said than done. Um, we say that a lot and putting that into practice is hard, but as human beings, we, we all have limits. And so if this is a particularly hard relationship to maintain, then it is important to take a break and prioritize your health too. Thanks. Thank you. It's interesting. I would just typed out in the in the chat saying to people, please be compassionate with yourself. So that was uh, beautifully said, Kim, and very, very true. So we hear from a really large number of adult children, neighbors, others with a very similar question. How do I support when I'm not the primary care partner? Who'd like to tackle that? Yeah, Laurie, thanks um, for highlighting that question today. And absolutely, there's no doubt that these can be very challenging scenarios for many. Uh, recently, I actually had an adult daughter share the dilemma her and her other siblings find themselves in at the moment. Um, and so mom uh, is the one that has dementia and is living at home uh, with in the family home with dad, who is the main care partner. Um, uh, dad feels very strongly that it's his duty to look after mom and he has consistently uh, resisted any offer of outside help. Uh, he will let his daughters help, uh, but even then um, he's reluctant and they're the ones that have to be, uh, you know, persist with it and offer. Um, he just always says that, you know, this is my job. Um, I don't want to be a burden to others. Uh, and also he says um, that he only wants to get help in when mom agrees to it. And so they both, actually both his uh, sisters work full time, have families of their own, and um, but they've been doing their very best to support their parents and also to, um, uh, to honor their wishes as best as possible, but they become, became really, really concerned. And especially as they watch dads becoming more frail and definitely on the verge of caregiver burnout. And then unfortunately, um, and that's why we were chatting a couple of weeks ago, dad took a really bad fall and is in the hospital and uh, with a, sincere, a serious concussion and a, couple, and a couple of broken bones actually. So it's pretty serious. And so, um, the, the dilemma now is there, mom, there is mom at home um, without any outside support and just the girls. And so, you know, this might seem an extreme example, but unfortunately it is not uncommon to see the care partner end up in hospital. And um, so Kim, um, what kind of strategies could you provide to us today to be more proactive so that we can hopefully avoid getting into this kind of a crisis. Yeah, thanks, Janine. Um, this is a really hard one and unfortunately it is a common scenario that we do see care partners finding themselves in um, and one that we do want to try to avoid. There's not an easy answer, but we have a few suggestions. Um, if you're the adult child or say another family member or friend, uh, it can often be hard to know how far do I push the primary care partner to accept help. So I would recommend trying to introduce some kind of respite or break for the primary care partner as soon as possible. So if, if you yourself are still in the very early stages, trying to introduce it now um, so that it can become part of the routine. So we can try to do this rather casually. So. Some ways that we can do that is if uh, we don't put any emphasis on saying that this is um, this is dad that needs this. So we're just going to take some time and spend it with mom. So how can we do this? I really want to get mom's hair done. Um, I hate to be at the salon alone. Do you mind if I take mom along? So the emphasis isn't on dad needs a break. Dad, I'm stepping in because you look tired. It's on, I just want to spend time with mom. I'm going to get her hair done. She loves to sit with me at the salon. Um, and yet dad is getting that break break as a byproduct of that. So um, another example might be that maybe the grandkids need more quality time. They want to learn about gardening. So these are just things that you can come up knowing what mom likes to do. And now mom's spending a few hours on Saturday helping with the vegetable plot. Even if that's not the case, we can involve her as little or as much as she can be. 
but the idea is that dad's getting a bit of a break um, and hopefully mom is getting positive um, interaction with the grandkids as well. Kim, so, yes. I just want to point out here, you guys several times have talked about emotional truth when supporting the person living with dementia. What just really struck me strongly with what you're talking about here is emotional truth for supporting dad. Mm -hmm. So, No, absolutely. I think we have to acknowledge that the, the primary care partner is often in a state where they may be emotionally drained and, and physically tired and we may, and they may be sensitive um, to us making them feel like they're not doing enough. They're not doing it right. Um, you need the help. And so if we can approach it in a way that's gentle and use those techniques around emotional truth and therapeutic fibbing, we can often frame it in a way that, that they're more likely to be open to it. And we're getting the benefits of mom getting quality time um, as well as dad getting a break. And I, I, I acknowledge this isn't always an option. We may not have all that family support in place. And during COVID, this, there's been a lot of restrictions that have prevented things like this from happening. Um, and that's where maybe getting a paid companion to come in or using uh, some services through the health authority may be an option as well. Um, I, just want to acknowledge that care partners, especially when they are the spouses, they can sometimes be quite protective of the person living with dementia. They may not want other family members to see how much they've changed. They may be fearful that they might be taken away from them. Um, they may be sensitive again to anything that implies that they're not doing it right or they're not doing enough or doing the care the way somebody else would. Um, so just being really mindful of that and gentle in the way that we approach them, um, the way that we frame the help. I would encourage you to be um, persistent in a gentle way, be creative, try different approaches, um, and just don't, don't give up. Make sure that they know that that support is there if they do need it. And then Victoria has a few other suggestions as well. Thanks, Kim. And I, uh, you know, I think that it, it bears to be highlighted and repeated again that exactly, you know, persistence is key. Be creative and try different things. Ultimately, you know the person or people that you're trying to support. And so take that knowledge of them and that information and try to um, use it so that those these strategies will hopefully be successful for them. Because as we discussed, what works one day may not work the next and what works for one person may not work for another. Um, some other things uh, very similarly to as Kim has mentioned is that you may want to, if you do have family or friends or neighbors, um, to set up a, a some tasks. So if the uh, the husband in the scenario that Janine gave us um, is resistant to letting care come in for his wife and he wants to be the primary caregiver and take everything upon him, it may be helpful to make a task sheet of everything that he does. So we really know what goes into the day because sometimes when you're in the thick of things and you're just trying to get the tasks done and get from one day to the next, you don't even realize how much is on your plate um, or you know how much is on your plate, but you don't actually realize each task that's on your plate until you're able to look at it. So writing out a task list and then being able to say, oh, maybe I could take this task or you don't have to do that. Maybe that something that I could help with may be something that um, is a strategy that could be considered. Again, we aren't able to um, tell someone what they need to do. So often um, we might just have to plant little seeds along the way and hope that those seeds wind up bearing fruit and that, you know, with time, some of the conversations we've started to have uh, may eventually be able to get in that support that's needed or we can be that support or whatever the case may be. Um, for some people as well, and depending how kind of techie you are or what that looks like for you, having a shared calendar can be be helpful um, because then that way if you know that mom has a uh, appointment and dad ha has taken her and it's a really long day you might want to make sure that you have time at the end of that day to call them and check in and see how things are going um, and so having some knowledge of that can be helpful um, as Kim suggested having those respite days scheduled and what that may look like so you know even if it can't be a full day maybe you you, you know 
know that they've had an appointment, so they'll be tired that night. So you show up with a casserole and say, oh, my neighbor made this casserole and I, she made two and I can't eat both. So one can be for you if that's okay with you. And again, it takes away hopefully some of that defensiveness because it's more putting them in a position of power or decision making so that they can say, oh, I'm in, I'm helping you rather than um, feeling that they need the help from someone. Again, it's also extremely important to recognize that this is physically and emotionally taxing work. Um, and it can be particularly challenging when we experience a role reversal. So where we kind of become the parent to the parent, or if we're maybe trying to share duties with a sibling who maybe we don't see eye to eye with, or maybe we're feeling guilty because a sibling is kind of taking that primary role because maybe they live closer to mom and dad. And so we are trying to help as best we can, but we don't know really where our role is in this. And that's something we hear is kind of that that person who's trying to support the primary caregiver and the individual living with dementia. And so really it's just about you know communication, trying different things, continuing forward. And if you are experiencing lots of guilt and grief about your role as a caregiver or supporting a caregiver and in an individual with dementia, it's so important um, as hopefully you've been able to do, do today, connect in the chat box or to speak with good friends. Or um, if you are an adult child, we do have an adult children um, support group that you can access because uh, we all have different roles to play and it all looks a little bit different than in what the care we're going to deliver is. So please Please, if you're feeling that guilt or that grief, know that that is part of this journey and this experience and that it is really important to look out um, and reach out for support for yourself as well as for the people that you're taking care of as well. Fantastic. Thank you very, very much, you guys. As I mentioned, the First Link Dementia Helpline, the number is one 800 936 6033. 